Back everybody in 1945, just days after completing the most highly classified naval mission of World War II, the USS Indianapolis was struck by two Japanese torpedoes. It sank within minutes, and nearly 900 went into the water, but only 316 survived a harrowing five nights and four days in what we now know were shark infested waters. The best selling book, Indianapolis, is now in paperback, and it tells the true story of the survivors and their 50 year fight to exonerate the innocent man wrongly court martialed for the sinking. Co author Sarah Vladek and USS Indianapolis survivor, survivor Harpo Salaya join me now. It's so mm -hmm. great and an honor to meet you. Thank you. Thank you for all you've done. Um, you entered the service very young. How old were you? Not 17. You were I entered on my 70th birthday. I got my father to sign for me on my 17th birthday. He gave me a first 17th birthday uh, by signing. Why, <laughs> the Navy. why did you want to go? Well, there had some uh, big uh, ads that I used to walk up by there when I was 16. They had big ads uh, with big, beautiful girls up on the... <laughs> Outside the federal <laughs> building, uh, when on um, ships and stuff like that. So I, I said, that's what I want. I want to go down where they have those. Where, where would girls. this is happening? I would like to do that. that. So you end up at Iwo Jima, and we have a little bit of a, a film that is put together that tells us what what happened at Iwo Jima with you. Let's take a listen to that. We were in uh, Iwo Jima when they raised the flag, and Santos had a watch that. He was up on top deck, and he had this big binoculars, and he hollered at me. He said, Celaya, come on down, they're going to raise a flag. He gave me the glasses, and I looked, looked at the flag, and I remember turning around and telling him, I said, big deal, and gave him back the glasses and walked away. And how did I know that it was going to become a, a famous, uh, you know, deal? And so every time I visited him, I got to come down to see him in Tucson. He'd always come, here comes the big deal guy, you know, he said. <laughs> big deal, Celaya, <laughs> coming our way. I became the big deal guy for him. Uh, yeah. so, so let's switch topics here to that night and people being in the water and the sinking of this ship. What do you remember about this? Uh, just trying to swim away from the ship was one of the things I, I remember swimming off because I didn't have a life jacket. So I jumped away from him. Benny and I jumped off the ship together because he had a life jacket and I didn't. So he said, stay with me and we'll, we'll uh, I'll, I'll help you uh, till somebody comes over and help us because uh, without a life jacket, you, we couldn't very well make it. I, but I didn't have a life jacket all the time I was there and wow. out in the ship. Uh, but I lost it since that first day. I. I hit something in the water, and when I swam out, I didn't find him, so uh, I thought I had hit him and knocked him unconscious or something, but so swimming out of there was my getting away from the ship. Uh, they always told you that there would be a suction from the ship mm -hmm. when uh, when it went down, so I, I swam as far away as I could. What, but what do you think kept you going? for five days? Well, I, I had a, a, a crew chief that I took care of for three days, and, and that kind of kept me busy all the time that I was trying to save him and help him out and stuff like that. So about the fourth day at night, I, I heard some uh, sailors uh, talking in Spanish. And I thought, oh my God, I'm, I'm going crazy with the salt water or something because I, and this was about maybe around 12 o'clock at night. And so next morning I, I went swimming around and, and I found Santo Spena and, uh, and my other friend, uh, Fernando Sanchez, where we're, they were from Tucson at the same time. So mm -hmm. they, made, they made me pretty happy to find them. Uh, so but when I went back, other. when I went back to my regular spot, what I had with my crew chief, he had taken off on on hook from, uh, so I lost him at that oh, time. I'm so sorry. Yeah, uh, Sarah, it, you're considered one of the foremost experts on what happened with the Indianapolis, which I think may be a, a story that's lost to 
um, generations today. Mm -hmm. Tell me how you contacted survivors, why you got so interested in this and wanted to make this you know, complete chronicle. Well, initially it started, I heard about it as a teenager and I thought, and it was reduced to a single line. It was the ship that carried the bomb and sunk. I thought, well, there has to be Go more. Go back just a second. Explain what the mission was. So the mission at the time was the Indianapolis was tasked with carrying the uranium for the atomic bomb, which would be dropped on Hiroshima. And this was all the uranium we had at the time. So this was one of the most classified and most important missions of the war. And had it sunk ahead of time, they would have had to wait an additional three to six months to gain enough uranium again. And then the invasion of Japan would have happened where they estimated you know, millions of casualties. So they were tasked with carrying this uranium. No one knew about it. The captain didn't even know about it. So young men like Harpo and his crewmates were carrying this atomic bomb across the Pacific on a high speed run. And they just delivered it to Tinian. And a couple days after that is when she was sunk. And so. I mean, I've even talked more in the last minute than what was in that documentary about World War II, and she's credited with ending it's, the, it's the war. It's just incredible, yeah. and we all need to know more, and the book is really yes. fascinating. And there was a, a, a person court-martialed for the sinking. Mm -hmm. Tell me how that turned into this kind of 50-year effort to clear his name. Well, so when the ship sunk, there were many things that went wrong, but one of the biggest problems was that the, you know, the flagship of the Fifth Fleet, Spruance's ship, disappeared and nobody knew. And how could that happen? How could the Navy let that go for five days with no one knowing she was gone and all these men dying in the water? So someone had to be to blame. And 879 men were lost. And so when the news comes out, the ship is lost and families want answer, who do they blame? Well, the captain's the easiest person to blame. He's ultimately responsible for the ship. So, you know, there were many people who should have been blamed, very high-ranking people, but the captain was the one that was ultimately court-martialed, and he was the first captain ever court-martialed for the loss of a ship during war. So there was more to it, and it took them 50 years. The survivors worked together. There were quite a few people that helped along the way, but they did exonerate their captain. What did the survivors tell you about why they were convinced he wasn't to blame? Well, they knew. I mean, even the, you know, the Japanese submarine, submarine commander who sunk them was called to testify. This was another first, to have an enemy come. And he even said he would have sunk the ship no matter what. It was coming right at him. But the court martial, the person who was doing the transcription and the translating, didn't translate that. They had another Why? motive. There were other people that should have been blamed, but again, these are high-ranking military officials. And, you know, this is right after the war ended. They announced the ship sank the same day they said the war ended. And Spruance, Nimitz, these names, these are the rock stars of this right, era. Right. So, um, covering them. So, eventually, Commander Hashimoto was was cleared, correct? Um, McVeigh, Captain McVeigh, McVeigh I'm was, sorry. yes. Yes, I, I'm sorry, I'm mixing two things up there. Um, there are times now when you get together with other survivors from the ship, right? I don't. Well, he's coming to his first reunion You're coming this to July. your first one? Yeah. Oh July. my goodness. Yeah. Tell me what you're feeling about seeing some of your comrades. Well, I, I won't see, uh, there's only about 12 left, so uh, there's only going to be about seven come to the reunion, so I'll see seven of them. And they may not recognize me, and I won't recognize them. <laughs> but uh, I had uh, different uh, feelings at that time that, that I didn't uh, go down there. I did go to one uh, because I, I received a court, uh, not a, a captain's mask, so they gave me five days bread and water. A month after uh, the ship had gone down, coming back from one of my own officers, and I went to my first reunion with uh, the captain, that, I mean, the pilot that found me mm -hmm. from San Jose. We flew down there. And I didn't want to tell him that I was going down to look for the pilot. <laughs> I mean, the officer that gave me the five days bread and water because I was going down to beat him up or do something. <laughs> well, I'm glad you two didn't find <laughs> each other in that case. Do but I did, he did come to the reunion, and I, and I never went back again. I, I'm grateful for all you've done in your life. Well, I am looking forward to you reuniting with some of your comrades. Well, How I often hope. do you think about what happened? Well, I, it, it doesn't, uh, I think about it every night, so I, I never get over it. Uh, 
I see a lot of uh, old westerns and everything at night because I'm still up at two, three o'clock in the morning so that I won't think of uh, things of the ship. And seeing old westerns and stuff in the, at night, uh, in the morning, it keeps my mind away from thinking of the uh, ship. But it just, it's always comes up to me. It never goes away. Well, one thing Harpo didn't tell you is that, you know, he came back from the war and he went back to high school. And he led his team to the state championships for basketball. I read about that. This is, yeah. I mean, like, you have had, like, 15 lives. Yes. It's, it's incredible. incredible. Ones. Yes. Harpo, thank you so much. Harpo, Sarah, and her co-author, Lynn Vincent, will be at Third Place Books in Lake Forest Park tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. The book is out now in paperback. Please do read it. It's, it's amazing, and we should know. More New Day after this.